is what I want to talk about. Today I prepared for you a nice surprise. After we finish this Midrash in 10, 15 minutes, then I will ask a very dear speaker that came specially from Florida to give us a few words of Torah. Also brought you some of his CDs that just came out. And uh, he is, Baruch Hashem, on the way up. We need uh, precious and straight speakers that speaks the truth. In today's generation, we are having less and less speakers like this. So when finally you find somebody that always said the truth with honesty, without getting scared, giving his life to save souls, then you know the future, Bezrat Hashem, will be extremely bright. Soon we're going to have Rabbi Aaron Ruven giving us some words of encouragement. Thank you for coming for the Rav, but now you enjoy me, hopefully. B'shut HaRav, B'shut HaRav, and also B'shut HaRav, and you'll find out today why. Uh, today, I want to cover a couple of small things, and hopefully you'll entertain me and actually listen. Uh, first, I'll say something small to add to what Kvod Arav said and you said about Shavuot, just to add something, a little bit of Tom, to that was my thought, individual thought, that I thought could be beautify the Torah for you a little bit. The second thing is, is some of you have come, have seen my shurim online, and uh, many have been attracted to my personal story. I decided to leave millions of dollars on Wall Street, all for Torah. I was on Wall Street, I had a lot of money, I was on CNBC, CNN, Bloomberg, one of those types of people. My uh, business card was gold, which is kind of interesting. And um, I left all of it for Torah and to do exactly what Kvod Arab has been doing for 22 years. I joined the army. I want to tell you why. But the why that I've told already many times is not the why I'm going to tell you today. The why I'm going to tell you today is the story no one knows about Rabbi Mizrahi. It's my personal story, Rabbi Mizrahi. So as far as adding, and then obviously, the Musar scale and what we can learn from it and why it affects you, why you should even listen to it. So, first and foremost, in regards to Shavuot, one of the main things that I got from it is that, in reality, according to the Gemara Masechet Abu Zarah. It is the most important day in history. Why? Because Chazal tells us that since Hashem came to all of the nation and offered them the Torah and they rejected it, all of the Malachim were very scared because they knew that if Am Yisrael rejects the Torah, Hashem will bring back the world to Tov Avo. Will destroy the world. Why? Because the Torah is the purpose of this world. That's why Hashem created it 974 generations before He created the world. In essence, the Jewish people were, in essence, became Jewish because of the Torah. They weren't Jewish before it. Obviously, as you've learned from Rabbi Mizrahi many, many times, before the Torah, we were Israelim. Before that, before that, we were Hebrews. But if someone else came to Mount Sinai, Chas Shalom, and accepted the Torah, and we didn't, they would be the Jews. So in essence, the most important day in history is Shavuot. Now, why do we go over the Torah, or at least try? Because Hashem is trying to give us a little bit of a taste of the beauty of the Torah, but in reality, we can't finish it. We can't finish the Torah, and that's why in Pirkei Avot, you'll see that it's not your obligation to finish the Torah. Rabbi Eliezer ben Hokino said to Rabbi Akiva once, you haven't come visit me in a long time. I have so much Torah to teach you. He says, how much Torah do you have? He says, if all of the water was ink, and all of the trees were pens, and all of the land was paper, it wouldn't be enough to write down the Torah that I know. And that is not even a close amount to the real Torah. What's the real Torah? Well, I'll give you an understanding of what we have. Now, we got the Torah in Mount Sinai. But as Kodorov said, we got a little bit of a lower version after our sin. But we still got the Torah. 
the Torah later was given from generation to generation to 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva. Unfortunately, all died. Then we were started all over again with five of Rabbi Akiva's students and Rabbi Akiva himself, all the way to today. But now, if you connect the holidays, if you go back to Pesach, it's a very important holiday. It's the Exodus. We left Egypt. We turned around history in one way that's never been done before and never will be done again. The slave turned into the master. And we go from Simcha to Simcha. Shavuot. But in the middle, we have a problem. In the middle, we have 34 days of disaster. The 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva died during this time. So what's the connection? So during one of, uh, I do a short chidush on WhatsApp and it's on uh, different uh, places that people like, is usually 15 minutes. And I tried to connect the three things. Why did Hashem take us from Simcha to Simcha, but in the middle there's a disaster? Well, first off, He wanted to tell us that the purpose of us leaving Eretz, uh, Mitzrayim is to get the Torah. Whoever didn't want to get the Torah died. As we know, at least 80% of the Israelim died in Egypt. Torah is later on, but in the middle, he wanted to explain to us what we actually have, because if we don't know what we have, we usually don't appreciate it. So the Torah that we got, according to Masechet uh, Megillah, it says that we had 55 prophets, 48 males and 7 females in our Tanakh. But in history, we had over 1.2 million prophets. So we're missing a few. Their Torah was holy too. What happened to them? Hashem told us that their Torah was only relevant, their nevoah, their prophecy actually, better said, their prophecy was only relevant to their generation. Which means that the 55 remaining prophets, whatever came out of their mouth, every single letter that's written in the Torah is relevant to every single generation until the end of time. So no one could ever say, like the reforms and the conservatives and any other wicked person in between, could never say, hey, no, this is not relevant to today. Today you're allowed to drive because Moses didn't have a car. You're allowed to drive on Shabbat. He didn't have a car, that's why he didn't drive. You can't, you can't say that. Why? Because if Hashem said, their Torah, their nevoah, their prophecy is relevant for all, all, all time, that's it. But now... We only have their prophecy. We only have their part of the Torah out of the 1.2 million. So already we know we're missing a bunch. And out of those 55, they, we got down to 24,000 students. But out of the 24,000 students, we don't have all of their Torah. We only have the Torah of six. Rabbi Akiva and his five students. So what would happen if Hashem said, you know what, it was about 700 of the greatest sages in history dying per day. We don't just mourn because we have nothing else to do. We mourn because we're missing their Torah. If you go on, for example, Hebrewbooks.com, they have over 75,000 Hebrew books, holy books, for free. And it wants to download, read, and so on. And there's hundreds of thousands of different Sifre Kodesh that you could learn from. The Torah is endless. But all of what we have today is just from six people. Which means that if Hashem would have skipped one day, said, you know what, today, I'm not going to kill the 700. So we'll have a Torah of 706. Imagine how much holiness this world would have. The beauty of it is that Hashem, Hashem obviously knew that even what we have from the six he has to practically beg us to read. <laughs> but at least now you know that when you get to Shavuot, Hashem is trying to give you a message. I only took you out of Egypt for this Torah. It's the only reason. If you didn't want the Torah, I left you there and you died in the plague of darkness, the uh, Makata darkness. You're going to get the Torah. But if I would have given it to you, without you knowing how much it's worth, you'd get it. you say, yes, 
No, I like Harry Potter better. <laughs> and you move along. But now that we know how much beauty we have from the little we have, we yearn for so much that we're missing. Now, one of the main things that about my personal story, I'll go through it in five minutes because there's not enough time. And then I'll go into the more interesting part about Rabbi Mizrahi. I've been telling, I've been telling myself that I'm going to say the story for years already, so. I, start, I came to the United States when I was 10 years old with my parents. I know three letters out of the alphabet, A, B, C, because that was in a serial. In Israel, I got some Jewish education. We learned some basic Torah. But my development in the Hebrew language, Torah, or anything related to Judaism ended at the age of 10. As soon as we landed in America, we officially became Goim. We didn't convert, thank God, but uh, we left everything. We just looked at everyone else, and all the other kids in the public school seemed so much cooler and so much more popular, I wanted to become just like them. This is why the Rav has been telling everyone for years that you cannot afford to send your kid to public school. It's not about just the teaching, which is zva already. It's not just that. It's the surrounding. Whether you teach him about the halachot of Shabbat every day after school or not is irrelevant. Once he's surrounded by that, he's not going to be able to hold on to it. He's not going to be able to. So I went to public school. I was considered a Talmud Chacham in public school. <laughs> I, went, I had, took advanced placement classes and got college uh, credit during uh, junior high school. And during high school, I had honor roll. Nice experience in school. In uh, fifth grade, I didn't know any English. In sixth grade, they sent me to special ed next to the kids that are disabled because I didn't speak the language. <laughs> By eighth grade, I'm taking college courses. So it was pretty cool. But then we went to college, went to college for one year, went to Binghamton University, had a 3.9 GPA, which is nearly perfect, and then I dropped out. Why? It's a waste of time. The point of education is to teach you how to think. You don't need history, you don't need English if you just live in the world, with, surrounded by people. Most of the stuff they teach you in school is really a waste of time, unless you have a point. Unless you're going to be a doctor or an architect or you have some type of profession that you're going to be. If you're just going to get a communications degree, then you're just torturing your parents, charging them $50,000 a year for absolutely no reason. And this is what's happening generation after generation now, but just the bill keeps getting higher where kids say, no, no, I'm going to college, Abba, I'm going to college. Where do you want to go? I'm going to Harvard. Abba gets a heart attack on the spot. <laughs> My retirement account is gone. Abba, I just graduated Harvard. Oh, what did you graduate with? I have a communications degree. <laughs> what, am I gonna, what are you going to do with it? Oh, I'm uh, nothing. I'm just, uh, I'm actually going to go back to delivering newspapers like I did in high school. <laughs> so, I knew how to think. I already started working when I was a young kid. I had three jobs in high school. And I knew how to sell. I knew how to speak. So I left school, I started working. Initially, I started doing a few different things, and then eventually I got into the brokerage business. The brokerage business, I paid my dues for the first three years, meaning I made a lot of other people a lot of money except myself. But after September 11th, Baruch Hashem, I got a break. My uh, boss screwed me, so I was able to finally be my own boss in a big company. 12 months later, approximately from the October of 2001 to November of 2002. So I guess uh, 13 months later, I made $117,000 in one month and became the number one guy in the office. Another nine months later, I became the number three producing broker in the country for a company with 5,000 brokers. I made my first million dollars. A year later, I, I, well, actually a few months later, I opened my own company. And then a bad month became $200,000 a month, sometimes 150 if I didn't work. And eventually got to the point where I started getting some fame. I was on CNBC, I was on CNN, I was on Bloomberg, all types of newspapers. It was very, very popular. And all of a sudden I had a bunch of friends. 
I never had friends, but now I had friends. I had one friend for 25 years. Is that the same he'll do to you one day? But uh, other than that, I never had friends. But now I had friends. I had all this money and all of them came with partners. Mm -hmm. So I gave all these friends jobs. They weren't really good, but I still hired them. Any miskin in the world came to me. I gave them a job. Some of these friends were religious. At least I thought they were. And my door was always open to people that want staka, need help. I was so busy in making money that I usually would just ask the guy as soon as he starts talking and he tells me about the problem and sometimes they're very emotional. I just tell him, how much does it cost? And they tell me how much it costs and I just give them the check and they go away and I go back to making money. And that was my world. I wasn't a bad guy, just I was busy. Donated a lot of money. And I was told by some rabbi that as long as I give staka, everything is fine. Now, I'm not going to name any names, chash shalom, but I want to explain to everyone why the truth, the hard truth, is the only way. It's not some people, yes, some people know it's the only way. As the Rav says many, many times, if Hashem didn't want us to know it, He wouldn't write it in the Torah. The Torah is available to all of the nations, not just to us. Every week, at least two religious people, some rabbis, some just religious, would come and ask for tzedakah and also give us a devout Torah. The door was always open. Sometimes it was three, sometimes it was four times a week, but nonetheless, at least two. I had my office for about 15 years, but let's just make the, the math very simple. Throughout all of this time, I'm keeping basically no mitzvot, except giving tzedakah, but I don't even think that was really the uh, highest I just had so much, it wasn't relevant to what I had. I'm married to a non-Jew. I don't steal, but in general, that's not exactly the only avira that I'm doing. I'm not keeping Shabbat, kosher, only in the house. I think that pizza, as long as it doesn't have any meat, is okay. Little do I know that the same cheese that I'm eating at the non-kosher place has pig in it. It's actually one of the basic ingredients that you have in all non-kosher cheese. But anyway, no one's telling me anything. But every week they get staka. But let's just do the math. Ten years, once a week. That means that any one of those religious people that came to my office had at least one shot every week to tell me something. Keep Shabbat. Maybe your wife should convert. Something. So if you do the math, it's 52 times a year, 520 times over 10 years. It's obviously much more than that. But if this politically correct strategy that people use was ever going to work, if it didn't work after 520 times, when is it supposed to work? When? I'm the failed experiment. I'm the one that showed that it doesn't work. You have to tell people the truth. So Hashem showed me the truth. When rabbis lied to me, Hashem showed me the truth. Only difference is it's a little more difficult. I'm not Moses, so he didn't speak to me through a, uh, through a burning bush. He spoke to me through hardship. In November of 2006, I, took, I had an elective surgery that went wrong. I went in healthy, I came out sick. But not sick like, oh, I have a headache. Sick like, I'm dying. Screaming in pain, nonstop pain. The doctors didn't know what went wrong. My entire nervous system was shocked. No one knew what was happening. For the next 62 days, the most amount of consecutive sleep that I was able to have was 15 minutes. And I started bleeding from my eyes and every other place that has a hole. So I was dying. But then I guess Hashem had some mercy on me, Baruch Hashem. He said, all right, let's give him a shot. So I started coming back to life. St stopped screaming 24 hours, it was only 12. Took at least 20 pa painkillers a day, so it's less than the 50 that I just had a week before. It's gone, Eden. 
<laughs> went back to work, went back to making $3,000 an hour, didn't do tshuva. Nine months later, there's a complication. I feel a pain in my leg, and I have to go to the emergency room, and I have my first of many, many surgeries. I have an internal infection that if, it, if I would have waited another hour, it would have exploded, gone into my blood system, and I would have died. I'm an intensive care unit next to the dying people for the next two weeks. Morphine in my blood system at all times just to survive, not fun. Okay, Hashem had more mercy on me and I did leave the hospital, but three months later I have another surgery. Another intensive care unit, more fun. Living in pain 24 hours a day. But now it's not pain just in the area I had the surgery, which is irrelevant, it's pain everywhere. From my neck all the way to the bottom of my feet, to the point where I wasn't able to walk anymore, I had to use a cane. So imagine this multimillionaire guy, 27 year old, has about $20 million in the bank, but he's with a cane and it takes him about 40 minutes to go from here to the door. How much is the money worth? Zero. So now I start losing money. I still didn't do tshuva. All the friends that I had all of a sudden became enemies, so they start stealing. I didn't really like them anymore. So they started stealing, they started cheating, started going to my competition with my clients. I'm a wounded animal, I can't defend myself. Little by little, things get worse and worse, I still don't get it. I went to over 50 different doctors, spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars trying everything and anything you can possibly try. When you have money, you can do anything you want, or at least you think you can. It's worthless. It gets to the point where I actually become, oh, the fly from your shiur came. Yeah, he came. I wanted to say. Baruch Hashem, I have Baruch Hashem. But I didn't think that Because last week they didn't show up in Queens. Ah, so he came here. Yeah, maybe he saw the flyer. He sent me an email. What happened to the fly? I said, maybe he finished his tikkun. I guess he liked the lecture. He liked the Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. I have a school, Baruch Hashem. I said to myself, well, he moved to here to move. Baruch Hashem. He yeah. yeah. saw the flyer. The flyer was nice. My wife made us a nice flyer. So. Now, I uh, get to a point where I go to over 50 doctors and eventually get to a point where I become a science experiment. I actually become part of a study. And they start injecting stuff into me every single day, which makes me feel like dying. Uh, they injected ozone, which you don't really want to do. Steroids, same thing that the athletes take. It costs a lot of money, by the way. And uh, everything and anything you can try. Nothing works. So once I heard that Hashem said, He's the healer. So I start paying attention. And I said, okay, these religious people are coming anyway. Let me see if one of them wants to teach me something. No one was really interested. So I went to a, uh, there was strictly business. So I went to a uh, class and uh, started learning. Later on, it was just once a week, but still not doing tshuva. But the situation started getting worse and worse. I started losing millions and millions of dollars just as fast as it came. It started leaving. And then one day I have a miracle where my mom dials a wrong phone number in a different country. And it ends up being the only person that could help me. She, one day she calls, she saw me a, day, a few days before that, I was looking worse and worse, and she started, you know, Sephardic mom always has a book of uh, rabbis, so she starts calling every single num number she has, but for two hours no one answers the phone. Eventually some lady in Israel answers the phone, she asks for a certain rav, and she says, I'm sorry, it's the wrong phone number, there's no such rav. My mom breaks down to this strange lady. She starts crying hysterical. And the lady says, Doris, which is my mother's name. So not only does this lady know her, but she can recognize her voice. My mom shocked and says, who are you? How do you know my name? She goes, I'm your niece. What's niece? Pnina. How, how did I reach you? I don't even have your phone number. I've never talked to you before in my life on the phone. 
Last time I talked to you was maybe 10 years ago, but I saw you in person. You were a little kid. He says, I don't know. But if Hashem sent you to me, then obviously there has to be a reason. Why are you crying? My son is sick. He's dying. He's this. He's that. I need some rough to bless him. She says, well, listen, why don't you call my brother, Rav Efraim. He's connected to Rav Avadia. He lives two doors down. He's Tamit Chacham. Call him. So she calls Rav Efraim. He calls her back because he's in a call. At the same time that Rav Efraim is talking to her, I never knew that Rav Efraim exists. I never knew he existed. I was, he was only a couple years old when I left Israel. We never talked. But anyway, my mom cries to him and tells him my sob, my, my sob story. And Rav Efraim says, does he speak Hebrew? He says, yeah, he speaks a little bit of Hebrew. He says, okay, can I call him? He goes, no, he won't talk to you. He doesn't talk to us, barely. And at that very same moment, which I find out later, I decided to call my mom on the other line. And she answers the phone hysterical, crying. I tell her, what's wrong, Ima, what's wrong? She says, talk to him. Who? Talk to him, to him. Who? Ephraim, who's Ephraim Bichlal? Why are you crying about this Ephraim? What did he do? Just talk to him, he can help you. Okay, anyone can call me, just stop crying. So Rabbi Ephraim calls me, and he tells me the story of Judah and Tamar. Little do I know that he also knows that I'm married to a non-Jew. I like the story. It's the first time I ever heard the story. I was already in my late 20s. Not a very uh, big compliment to my Torah knowledge at that point. And I like the story. So I started asking him questions. See if he answers. I ask him business questions, he answers. I ask him Torah question, he answers. But he doesn't just answer like, you'll ask me a question, I'll answer you, but I'll sometimes give you an answer with no source. He gives me a page number, a book, and an exact year was written, something amazing. Like, oh, I thought I was smart, this guy is something out of this world. So we talked for an hour and 40 minutes. You're going to miss your story. <laughs> he knows the story, I'm just kidding. We talked for an hour and 40 minutes. It was a very nice conversation, and a week, uh, a week later, he calls me at the same time, Thursday at 4 o'clock. We have a three-hour conversation. I ask him questions. He gives me answers with a source, and he makes me feel good. Every time I ask a question, he goes, oh, what a great question. Yo, so-and-so asked the same question 852 years ago. So I, I feel like, oh, yes, of course. Of course he has the same question as me. <laughs> so... He tells me the answer, he tells me the source, and I just start coming up with new questions. I never even knew I had all these questions. For the next nine months, every Thursday at four o'clock, we had an average call between five to seven hours. Only questions and answers. Later on, he tells me that he used to pray before the call to know the answers. And I said, what do you mean to know the answers? You even know the page number and the guy and this and that. He goes, I didn't even know the questions. I never asked the questions you asked. I never cared about the stuff you did. But when you asked them, it was pretty good questions, and Hashem gave me the answers. Siyat Dishmai is what we call it. The special Siyat Dishmai you get when you do Kiruv. So now how does Rabbi Mizrahi get into it? So now, little by little, I start learning Torah with him. Everything I learn, I teach my wife, who for some strange reason always wanted me to be a religious Jew, even though she was not. And she would tell me to stay home for the holidays, and i tell her why. And when people would ask me, don't you want your wife to convert, have Jewish children? I said, I'm not doing it. Why should I tell her to do it? I'm not a hypocrite. Can't tell her to do something I'm not going to do. It's not fair. You can't just make somebody Jewish. It's either they want to be Jewish or not. You can't just make someone stop believing something. I used to make fun of the Christianity in general. I used to call it the remix. <laughs> you know, they took our Torah and they mixed it up a little bit. They made something new. It has mistakes in every single page, as every one of you has seen in the debate. There's a nice Kiddush Hashem that's eternal. I think that's what they're going to show Rabbi Mizrahi when he gets to his Olam Abba, or at least the first part of his Olam Abba. He's going to show him the debate. See, this, this is a good one. This got you the first few ones. <laughs> So now, you can't just make somebody stop believing. But now, little by little, I'm learning Torah. 
and I'm realizing that I still start to smell something funny. I start to smell the garbage that I'm in. See, the problem is when you're part of the garbage, you don't smell anything. You can't smell anything. You're part of it. You start leaving with some Torah, you become a little bit, eh, half of a percent or a percent of a percent kadosh because you learn seven hours a week. You start smelling it, something funny. So I start realizing there's something wrong with my picture. Maybe it is a problem. So I start learning more and more Torah and I said, you know what? I guess my wife has to convert, but how do I get that? How do I get her to convert? So I tell her, you want to convert? She says, no, I don't think you can. I said, no, I, I've heard somebody said you can convert. She goes, no, no, I don't think you can leave. Then it's a problem. It's this, it's that. Neither one of us knew anything. She knew Proverbs by heart, but she didn't know that conversion even existed. No one ever knew you could leave idol worship. We didn't even know it was idol worship. So now I start learning about Christianity. Because I realized that you can't make someone stop believing something. You can't just say, listen, you believe X, Y, Z for 30 years? Okay, stop. <laughs> and replace it with this. It's not ice cream. You can't just exchange after you took a bite because the guy's really nice. You can't. So first you have to prove that it's wrong. And then you have to give them something good. The problem is that in between... There's nothing. There's an emptiness. And that's why most converts, when they actually get to that point, when they get to the point of nothing, before they know the Torah is true, 100% divine, there's a point of emptiness that's a disaster. Some of them really want to kill themselves during that time. Because you thought you had something, and now you just realized your entire life was fake. Everything you believed your entire life is nothing. It's just a mistake. It's almost like a Baal Tshuva, but not to, some, to the same extent. And now there's something else, but you're still not 100% sure. So now you don't really have anything. There's no purpose. It's a very, very difficult stage, which is the reason why Hashem has special treatment for them. And why they're mentioned in the Torah more than anything else. And why even in Amidah we mention them before we mention us. Convert that chooses Hashem considered higher than a natural born Jew but a righteous convert not just any convert because they had a nice boyfriend from a Syrian family with a lot of money <laughs> so now I start learning about Christianity and I become obsessive first rabbi I went to was uh, Rabbi Tovia Singer he was very good speaks extremely fast which was my style I was a Wall Street guy I trained over 130 different salesmen I had all these people out that was my style fast, 150 miles an hour, telling me all these verses. It's amazing. I showed it to my wife after about 10 seconds. She said, okay, thank you very much. And not interested. He talks too fast. So then I had Rabbi Fryan give me uh, some proofs that he can find because whatever I'm doing is not working. He writes a whole letter with proofs and proofs and proofs and proofs and proofs and I read it to my wife. She's hysterical crying and she says, no, thank you. I like the Torah, but it doesn't mean that I have to be Jewish. I can still keep the Torah. I continue to find different things. One day, after watching one video after another, I get a recommended video on YouTube. They have a part of this mitzvah, maybe. The debate. So I said, oh, this looks interesting. So I press on the debate. I watched the debate. It's amazing. But there's one problem. Until this, until now, I just thought that Christianity was second best. <laughs> Like, I didn't know what I knew now. Like, I, now I've become obsessed with it for months and months and months and months. And I'm learning all these things, all these verses and everything else. But the debate made me realize that it's outright fake. It's not second best. It's outright idol worship. It's nothing. So now the most important person in my, most important person in my life 
is idol worshiping without even knowing it. Now it's not having her convert so it makes my situation a little better with Hashem. Now I have to save her. Now it's different. So, I show her the first part of the debate and I say, listen, you got to watch this thing. This is really good because all this time we've been learning some Torah. She loves Torah. But again, you can't remove a belief. So I show her the first part of the debate. She struggles through the first one. After the first one, first, you know, it's three parts. After the first one, she says, nah, I don't like the, that, that priest is a moron and the rabbi is arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> just to let you know by now she's probably watched um, I would say at least 85 to 90 percent of all of Rabbi Mizrahi's lectures she's a big tzaddikah she's the only rabbi she watches but initially the satan she hated him hated which is what the satan does because this was the cure so now, I argue with her and argue with her. Now, for, we've been together for many years at this point. I think we were together for maybe eight or nine years. Never had one fight. All of a sudden, since this conversion stuff came up, we have fights every single day. And now I'm arguing with her for about a week and a half just to watch part two. <laughs> she watches part two. Unfortunately, similar conclusion. But there's a few good things in there that you can't, really can't have answers for. Why does it say 75 instead of 70 people came down to, to uh, Egypt? Why is the Ma'arat Machpelah in the wrong location? Why, why, why? There's no answers. So now, we're starting to remove the Tameh. Because the first thing you have to do when you do Kiru, the first thing you have to do when you help somebody learn the truth, is convince them and show them that they're wrong. It's irrelevant if you're right. If you're right and they feel they're right, you're still not going to win. First, you have to completely prove them wrong. You have to make them at least question themselves that maybe I'm wrong. Because as long as he thinks he's right, there's no reason for him to change. Okay, your Torah is good for you. Thank you very much. It's not for me. Because I think that what my lifestyle is, of driving to Biknesset because my rabbi doesn't say anything, of giving a bar mitzvah to my dog because I saw it on YouTube, <laughs> eating McDonald's whenever I want, I think it's fine. This is the problem. So you have to show them that they're wrong. That there's something wrong here. God said something else. He said, Im telechu. says you have to take the mitzvot, you have to take the Torah everywhere. Not ta'asu, not just do them. You have to take them everywhere. When you're on vacation, you still have to be religious. When you go to Israel, you still have to be religious. When you move somewhere else, you have to be religious. You have to take the Torah with you everywhere. It's not optional. It's not a uh, hobby. So now that I realize that getting to part three is not going to happen, and by the way, until this day, she never watched part three. But now we have some questions. So I start researching more and more, getting more questions, getting more questions. And she's at a point where she says, listen, I just need some type of sign from Hashem in the Torah. I believe the Torah is 100% true. Never question it in my life. But I need something from the Torah that tells me this is the right thing. Now Hashem told us in Sefer Dvarim, Deuteronomy, chapter 4, if you look for me, with all of your heart and all of your soul, you'll find me. But not just if you look for me. Even after you've made all of the sins in the world, to the point where you worship the God of wood, the man-made God of wood, and the man-made God of stone. Which, by the way, as we know from the Rav, is Christianity and Islam. Even after you make all of those sins, and in chapter 4, verse four, four, uh, chapter 4, verse 29, from there you will seek Hashem, your God, and you will find Him. If you search for Him with all your heart and all your soul. 
which means if you want to find a shem, you have to actually look. Not like you look for the cat behind the garbage, you don't find him, you say, okay, I'll buy a new one. You have to actually dedicate your life to finding a shem. And that's what we started doing. So 24 hours a day, we're looking for a shem. 24 hours a day, I'm, le I'm learning to I'm trying to sleep maybe two, three hours a day. I'm becoming very, very obsessive and a little bit of crazy. She's waking, you know, she goes to sleep, wakes up at a normal hour, and I'm like this, honey, look, I have more proofs. <laughs> what? What do you want? I have more proofs. Look, look, there's this, there's this. So then one day, Hashem, obviously, after enough tears, a lot of tears, a lot of prayers, a lot of arguments, Hashem finally sends His salvation. YouTube recommends another video. <laughs> It's called Torah and Science. <laughs> so now, the Torah and Science by itself should be a lecture. Just the, uh, the story about, my, about what happened with Torah and Science. We watch, well, I tell, listen, Torah and Science, we actually have been reading Rabbi Zamir Cohen's book, you know, every, uh, you know, every so often we read a few pages. You no, know, we like science, we like Torah, it's nice, it seems interesting. Okay, all right, fine, put it on already. Same arrogant guy, okay, fine, I'll read. <laughs> we watch part one, there's three parts again. Part one, both of us at the end of it, amazed. We didn't know all this stuff existed. Really, this is what it says, we're looking at verses, we're showing something out of this world. It's the most amazing thing that you could ever imagine, the ex best experience ever. Like, wow, we have to watch part two, it's two o'clock in the morning. Click on part two, doesn't work. Look for it somewhere else, click on part two, doesn't work. Satan's working at overtime. <laughs> now I have a little bit of a scratch, just so you know. I'm the kind of person that reads the preface of a book and it says the project of Masora Heritage Foundation and the names of all the people that contributed all the way to the end of the book, I read everything. <laughs> I'm the guy they wrote it for. <laughs> so now, I, <laughs> I think there's at least one guy left. Maybe somebody else reads it, but I think I'm the only guy. But anyway, I have to do things in order. A little bit of a scratch. So now part two doesn't work. We can't watch part three. But I've seen her, she's really interested. I'm like, you know what? Part one was so good. Ah, right, you know what? Let's just watch part three. Watch part three. Now we know for sure the Torah is divine. There's no question at all. God is real. The Torah is the document. But we still have, we're missing something. Now she knows that there's a problem with Christianity. But she still didn't get the sign she still didn't get to 100%. But she, she did get to emptiness. She got to nothing. So she prayed that night that Hashem either show her the sign, show her proof, give her something, or kill her. Because she doesn't want me to go to Gehenom. Because she knows that if she stays with me, I'm going to Gehenom, and she can't deal with the fact that she has to leave me. So that's what she prays for. Now her prayers, they actually get to Shemaim, hopefully mine get to the ceiling. <laughs> the next morning, Hashem answers her. She wakes up, Tisha B'Av, horrible mood. And I finally found at 6 o'clock in the morning, lecture number two works. <laughs> <laughs> She's all angry. I'm like, honey, I got number two, I got number two. Okay, you know what? Fine, fine, fine. We watched number two, one and two, and one and three. He wasn't so bad this time. Fine, I watched number number two. Number two, if anyone remembers, is when Rav Mizrahi talks about the Torah codes. But not only talks about the Torah codes, he talks about the very same chapter that I just read to you, chapter four in Deuteronomy. Right before, if you seek for Hashem, you'll find Him. Before that, Hashem in verse 27 says, Hashem will scatter you among the people and you will be left few in number among the nations where Hashem will lead you. There you will serve gods, the handiwork of man, 
of wood and stone which do not see and do not hear and do not eat and do not smell. Here Rav Mizrahi showed, in the Hebrew obviously, which I'll read in a second, is the only place that you can actually see not only that it's obvious who the false god of wood is, you don't need to be a genius to figure that one out, or the false god of stone is, which according to Christianity, they don't read this part apparently, because no one knows this. But in the Torah codes, you could actually find both of their names inside this verse. If you skip 49 letters, you go, you start from the feet. The He is the first letter. You skip 49 letters. You get to Chaf. You skip 49 letters, I believe, if I remember correctly, 49 letters. And you, uh, um, you get to the Mem. That's Mecca. Same word, Efitz, which is the first word. Hashem will scatter meaning. You start with the Yud. Skip 49 letters. You get to Shama, which is Shin. You skip 49 letters. You get to Yishmeon, which is the same ending word that you found Mecca in, the Mem. You find Vav. Imach Shimo Vezichro. You find JC. He always wanted a place in the Torah. He goes, he got himself a place right next to idol worship. <laughs> For me, it was pretty cool. I mean, I've seen some Torah codes before. But for her, it was everything. If there was a bed thing next to her, she would convert on the spot. But not like a convert, like, listen, I'm not so sure. Maybe this, maybe that. Day one, everything. Kisui Rosh, Tzniut, learning, everything. Became the biggest tzedekah that I personally know. Brother Rav has been telling all of you for years, spend some time doing Kiruv. I left everything that I could possibly think of, dream of, and everything that I was good at to make the biggest investment in my life, which is all of my time, do Kiruv. I wasn't a fool. I knew how to invest. I can go back to Wall Street and make money. But that's not what Hashem sent me for training. He sent me to Wall Street for 16 years to train, to teach me to speak, and to eventually create more Jews. We have a lot of businessmen in the world. We don't have enough Jews. Now that CD that someone gave, that person that sponsored this Yul, the person that taped it, the person that's handing it out, changed my life. And for the last few years, Baruch Hashem, we've been doing Kiruv and trying to help people do Tshuva. And Baruch Hashem, and Be'ezrat Hashem, tomorrow one of my students is going to the Bed Din and converting. <laughs> well, so, every one of us needs to know one thing. If you do Kiruv, and I'll finish it off with this, you could all take it into account. In Sefer Yeremia, the Jeremiah tells us, verse 15, 19. Hashem is telling us a little bit about Kiruv. Most of us have a hard time either doing tshuva. In the beginning, it's hard for us to build emunah. It's hard for us to change our surroundings. It's hard for us to connect 100%. It takes time. It takes effort. You have to sweat. You have to look for Hashem with all of your heart and all of your soul. He really meant it when he wrote it. So Hashem says, there is a little bit of help that I can give you if you do something small. Lachen ko amar Adonai, im teshuva ashivecha lefanai, ta'amod, v'im totzi akar mizolel, kepiti yeh. 
ישובו המה אליך ואתה לא תשוב אליהם. Therefore thus said Hashem If you repent I'll bring you back and, land you, and, and let you stand before me Meaning your tshuva is always accepted Even if someone that's a machtia rabin Someone that's making other people sin Even though he doesn't have the same siyat dishmaya As we learned from Pirkei Avot He can still do tshuva Tshuva is open for everyone even if he gets to a point of doing idol worship, he could still do tshuva. Obviously, he has to suffer and go through a tikkun, but nonetheless, tshuva is available, and Hashem says, once you finish your tshuva, you complete your tshuva, you'll stand right next to me. I'll accept you like all of my Jews, my entire nation. But, if you bring forth an honorable person, meaning a righteous person, from a glutton, then you will be like my mouth. If you do tshuva, you'll stand next to me eventually. Complete your tshuva. It's a big deal. But if you help someone else do tshuva, kepiti ye. What does you'll be like my mouth mean? The Midrash has many, many things about it, and so does the Gemara, and so does several other books. But I'll read only a couple of things to give you a little bit of understanding. The Midrash on uh, Mizmo uh, and on uh, Tehilim 116 uses this verse. And it says, Hashem says to the Tzadikim, I am the creator, the ones that do Kiruv. I am the creator of the worlds and bring back the dead. You're the same. Your prayers, just like Rabbi Mizrahi has been telling us for many, many years, that the people in the Gemara that are named by name, they were able to revive the dead. It's not that they had power, but their prayers got a VIP treatment. Which means that if you spend time every day out of your busy schedule to help one of his children, whether it's by giving him a CD, helping a Kiruv, Rabbi, that's changed my life, and I'm sure many of yours or all of yours, Supporting Kiruv, putting links if you're already on the internet, enough with the sports, and maybe put some links for the Shuret Torah. You spend some time every day, not just once a week, once in a while, but every day doing something for Kiruv. Arrange Shurim, get people to come, something. Hashem says, Kepitiye. You have a special deal. Your prayers that haven't been answered, you have the secret. Spend some time doing Kiruv. The Zohar says, if people knew the value of helping somebody do tshuva, they'd run around in the streets like crazy people looking for chilonim, looking for people that are not religious. In one of the drashot that Rabbi Vadya Zechet Tzadik Levacha said, he said, Someone that's a tzaddik, that's born into a right family, goes to school, becomes a very righteous person, a big tzaddik, he gets to the Olam Abba, which is right next to Malachi Asharet, the angels of God. He gets right next to them. Nice place. But someone that's a star, meaning a star, Ovadia is using Sefer Daniel as a source in several other places. A star, a star is someone that spends time doing Kiruv. He gets to a level higher than Malachi Asharet. He's the only one, there's only room for him. Only Kiruv people are there. It's a big deal. When I was in the Wall Street, the only thing I did is invest. That's all I knew. And I'm sure all of you know a little bit of Torah. I'm sure all of you know a few people that are not religious. And there's a very big disparagement between the religious and non-religious world. People that are religious think that the non-religious just don't want to do it. They don't realize that most of them just don't know. 
So the only thing I can tell you is that if you have some Torah knowledge, if you have some discs, if you have some money, if you have some time, if you have anything, if you care about Hashem, you have to spend five minutes a day doing Kiruv. Five minutes. Five minutes. You're not asking for an hour. You're not asking for anyone to become the next big Darshan unless you can. But five minutes a day do Kiruv. Because we have to save 15 million people. Rav Mizrahi can't do it by himself. I came to help and I can't do even a quarter of what he did. So, we need some more, we need to build an army. If everyone spends five minutes a day sending discs, giving discs, giving links out, sending text messages, to, you know, putting WhatsApp groups together, gathering shiurim, doing something. Every one of your prayers, Bezat Hashem, will be answered. And hopefully we can be sharing Allah and Ba'a with Rav Mizrahi. Amen. Amen. Amen.